Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about one of the basic building blocks commonly found in RF equipment, usually in between amplifier stages, the Rotroff Impedance Transformer. This can be built with all sorts of impedance ratios, but to get it to work over a wide frequency range, you need to treat it like a transmission line transformer. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. To keep things simple, today I will stick to the 1 to 4 Rotroff impedance transformer. But you can easily build any other impedance ratio. However, the same basic principles need to be applied. But speaking of the 1 to 4 transformer, I found three main ways of implementing it. You have the transformer version, the transmission line version, and then you have this thing. Is this even the same circuit? Well, to figure things out, let's start with an experiment. So, what I have here is an implementation of such a transformer that on the one side is connected to the VNA and on the other to a 100 ohm load resistor. This is built from around 40 centimeters of 50 ohm coax cable put onto a ferrite core. And if everything works as expected, this transformer should perform the 1 to 4 impedance transformation, therefore, taking the 100 ohm load resistance and turning it into 25 ohms on the VNA side. So, when looking at the measurement result, we can see that this transformer does indeed present a more or less stable 25 ohm impedance on the measurement side at relatively low frequencies. So, these two markers are placed at 1.78 MHz and at 43 MHz. So, at low frequency, we see this drop off caused by the limited inductance of the transformer. And at high frequency, we see a small drop in impedance, then a massive jump, and then another drop, and so on. Now, to better understand why this type of behavior is occurring, let's turn to the circuit simulator to verify things. So, first thing to check is the basic transformer implementation. For this, I use 10 microhenry inductors as an arbitrary value. The practical circuit probably has a lower inductance, though. But the point is just to confirm the behavior. So the simulation is set up as an AC simulation so that we can get the wideband behavior and I also added in a dot net statement so that we can observe the impedance from the signal source side. So if we run the circuit and we plot out the input side impedance, we do see our low frequency limitation. So the impedance is dropping off at low frequency and this is coming from the transformer's inductance. The higher this inductance will be, the better the low frequency behavior. But if we look to the other end, so the high frequency end, we are getting a perfectly flat response. So this bit at least is not really matching our measurement. So the next circuit to check out is the same thing, but built with a transmission line. So here the two lines are coupled, both magnetically and electrically. So this should also perform the task of a transformer. If we again check the input side impedance, well, the low frequency behavior seems to be ideal. That's not good. But at least at the high frequency end, it does seem to behave similarly to our measurement. We are getting our flat 25 ohm response for a while, after which the impedance drops before suddenly rising. So a realistic model will have to combine the two behaviors that of the ideal transformer at low frequencies and that of the ideal transmission line at high frequency. In the equivalent model of a transformer, usually you will add an ideal coupled transformer. This is responsible for taking energy from one side to the other, but this by itself is not frequency limited. The limiting element is the magnetizing inductance on the primary, which is the uncoupled inductance of the winding. So at very low frequency, this inductor is shorting the input signal and not letting any energy get to the ideal coupled bit that pushes energy to the other side. Now, if we look to the transmission line model, well, this just contains the ideal bit, the two coupled lines. So to get the correct low frequency behavior on the transmission line, we need to somehow add the same magnetizing inductance that was present in the model of the transformer. So if we add this inductor, 
we should get the correct low frequency behavior, characteristic of the transformer, but also keep the high frequency behavior, characteristic of the transmission line. So back in the circuit simulator, I added an inductor in parallel with the transmission line. And if we rerun the simulation and we plot out the impedance seen from the signal source side, we do seem to be getting both behaviors. So at low frequency, the impedance drops off and at high frequency, we seem to be getting this oscillation in the impedance, the dropping and then rising. If we plot out all three of our measurements, so we add in the impedance seen on the ideal transmission line and then the impedance on the ideal transformer, we are getting a very nice overlapping of our free measurements. So the low frequency behavior of our transformer and the high frequency behavior of our ideal transmission line are both seen in the final model that combines the two. So at the moment, we have a simulation model that is replicating our measurement. So what can be done to improve this high frequency behavior? After all, all of these impedance spikes are not something that you really want. To better understand what's going on and how to fix it, we need to look at how this transformer is supposed to work. So if we take our one to four Rutroff transformer and redraw it a bit, this way we can highlight that this is used as a voltage transformer. So if we apply V1 on the low impedance input, this voltage is induced into the second winding through the transformer and the total voltage on the high impedance side is then two times the input voltage. So it's the voltage drop on the two inductors. In other words, this transformer is adding two voltages together. So how hard can this be? Well, if we look at DC batteries, as long as you connect them in series, so plus the minus, the total voltage will be the sum of the two individual sources. But with AC sources, this becomes a bit more complex because now you need to take into account not just the individual voltages, but also the phase shift. So as long as the frequency of the two sources is the same, we have two extreme cases. With zero degrees of phase shift in between the two signals, so they both have the same phase shift, the total voltage will be the sum of the two, just like with the DC battery. But in case we have a 180 degrees of phase shift in between the two signals, then the total voltage will be the difference of the two. And well, with any sort of angle in between, you will get some other value. Now, there is a way to properly calculate this, of course, but the point is that the only way to get the sum of the two voltages is if the phase shift is zero. Now, if you're treating the transformer as a lumped element, then the phase shift in between the two voltages is exactly zero. So the two voltages nicely add up. We have an ideal behavior over any frequency range. Now, if we turn to the transmission line model, we have the same operating principle. The voltage is mirrored on the other side. So the high impedance side will add up the voltage coming through the line with the initial voltage from the signal source to form the total output. So the sum should be the two voltages added up. But one thing to keep in mind is that if we keep say V1 as our reference, this has zero degrees of phase shift, and this is one of the voltages that gets to the end, but the other voltage that arrives through the transmission line has a specific phase shift given by the exact length of the line and the working frequency. So the two voltages that get added up have a non-zero phase shift in between them. In other words, it's perfectly normal to get the effect that we were measuring and simulating. At relatively low frequency, the phase shift in between the two voltages is negligible, so the total voltage is more or less the sum of the two, and the impedance transformation is working as expected. Then as frequency increases, this voltage starts to drop until it reaches zero. This is occurring when the line is at its half wavelength frequency, so here the phase shift is exactly 180. And after this, the cycle repeats. So the phase shift decreases and then increases and so on. So if we want to fix the high frequency behavior of this structure, we need to somehow make sure that the two voltages that are added up have exactly zero degrees of phase shift in between them at any frequency. Or in other words, have the same phase shift 
in reference to the input. And this is achieved by adding an extra delay line with the same electrical length as our first piece. So this needs no magnetic core, it's just there to be a transmission line that has the same electrical delay as the first piece. And by adding this, both voltages that arrive at the end have the exact same phase shift. And then they can nicely add up. So that's the theory anyway. We can first check this in the simulator. So if we look at our first structure and we analyze the voltages at the beginning and at the end, so the two voltages that end up being added up, we can see that as long as the phase shift in between the two signals is more or less zero, then the two are being added up nicely. So the output voltage is larger than the input one. But as we move to higher frequencies, where the phase shift starts to become more and more significant, the addition no longer yields the expected result. So the output voltage is no longer double that of the input voltage. Now, if we add in our delay line, and we look at the output voltage and the voltage coming through the delay line, we are getting a completely different story. The two voltages that arrive at the end have a consistent phase shift, so there is a phase shift in reference to the input, but there is no phase shift in between the two signals, so the total output voltage stays constant and flat. In other words, if we now look at the impedance seen from the input side, we are getting a very nice and flat high frequency response. So the way in which you can get this sort of transformer to produce a flat wideband impedance transformation is at the lower end by increasing the inductance using ferrites or other magnetic cores. And at the high frequency end, you will need to compensate for the transmission line delay by using an extra delay line. To check this, I took another piece of 40 centimeter coax and wound it on a plastic core, so just to keep things nice and tidy. And then proceeded to interconnect the two into the final transformer. And when looking at the results, well, surprisingly, this went quite well. I got an almost flat response over the entire measurement range. So small imperfections still occurred, but we have a much better result than before. So this time the markers placed are the green one at around 800 kilohertz, the red one is at 134 megahertz, so in this region it's more or less flat, and then if we ignore this small drop here, we have a very decent and usable transformation up until the blue point at 320 megahertz. Now the improvement becomes even more clear when we look at the two measurements overlapped. So the red measurement is the old measurement without the delay line, and the green one is the measurement with the delay line. But anyway, other than the delay, would there be anything else to keep in mind when building this sort of transformer? Well, the last thing to look at is the transmission line's impedance. So in general, for this type of impedance transformer, the line's impedance is supposed to be the geometric means of the input and output. So for the 1 to 4 transformer with 25 ohms on the input and 100 ohms on the output, the line should be at 50 ohms. So this can be understood if we remember that to have a good matching, there should be no impedance discontinuities in our circuit. So on the 100 ohm side, this connects to 250 ohm impedance traces in series. So we get a match of 100 ohms to the 100 ohms of the lines. And then on the other side, the 250 ohm transmission lines are in parallel so that we get a half value. So we can properly connect to our 25 ohm load. So again, we have a match. So even if the transformer is built differently, this same principle needs to be applied. All of the lines on one side need to match to that impedance, and all of the lines on the other side need to match to the, well, connecting impedance. So as long as all of the impedances are matched, we should get a perfectly flat response. But if the line impedance is not the value that we should be using, well, we will get the effects of mismatch. And here, just an example, I build the same structure, but with a 75 ohm transmission line. So if we run the circuit and compare the input side impedances, we are no longer getting the right impedance transformation at high frequency. So even though we have the right transmission line delay, because the line's characteristic impedance isn't the right value, we again see all sorts of variations. And the bigger the mismatch is, 
the worse the effect will be. Final point to mention is that I first tried making this experiment with twisted cable transformers. So on the one side with this small enameled copper wire and then a wire that has this plastic insulation. In both cases it was twisted wire, but I could never properly control the impedance. So when measuring this sort of transformer, my graphs are always a bit wonky. So I could never make it to, to look a bit more flat. Now one thing I noticed was that even though the cable is twisted, after you start coiling it or doing other things, the twists start to come undone. So the wire to wire distance isn't really maintained if you closely look at the cable. In other words, you're not really maintaining a constant impedance. So this sort of transformer can be built with twisted cables, but only if you take a lot of care. However, it's far easier with coax cable, since here the impedance is far better controlled by the cable itself. Now, it's worth mentioning that adding the extra delay line and keeping line impedance under control is not really mandatory. If the impedance transformer is used at relatively low frequency, so the line's electrical length is less than about an eighth of the signal's wavelength, then it won't really matter. It will just behave like a lumped element transformer. The line properties start to matter only when working at relatively high frequency, when the transmission line coupling is the main operating mode. In that case, both the length and the characteristic impedance need to be strictly controlled to get the best results. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date on my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.